Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Disaster Philanthropies webinar, uh, Disaster Case Management, Navigating Recovery One Person at a Time. Before we begin, I do wanna take a moment and state that we are watching the devastation happening in Maui uh, with heavy hearts and um, grave concern. This disaster along with others in our world, the faces and the stories of those on the front lines continue to drive us towards the work we do. We're gonna be adding additional information and resources to our website shortly. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out um, if we can be of assistance in any way. My name is Carrie Cullen. I am the director of the Midwest Early Recovery Fund at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Previously, I served as the humanitarian special projects team lead as Lutheran Social Services of North Dakota, where I worked as a disaster case manager and, recovery, and in recovery programming. I so also served as the project manager for the Midwest Consortium of Disaster Services, managed special events for New American Services, and initiated and led the agency's work with victims of labor trafficking. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer them at the end of the panel presentation. If you are on X, formerly known as Twitter, or threads, please use hashtag CDP for recovery. That's CDP, the number four, recovery, to share and join in the discussion. And don't forget to follow us on both at Funds for Disaster. At the web end of the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please complete this to help us improve our webinar offerings and to better meet your needs. And finally, we are recording this webinar. It will be available on our website and YouTube channel shortly after the webinar is complete. Live captioning is available now via Zoom. Click on closed caption live transcript to access it and more accurate captions will be available in the recording. We wanna take a moment to thank our co-sponsors. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Council on Foundations, Giving Compass, The Funders Network, Philanthropy California, United Philanthropy Forum. And we want to thank them all for their support. As we begin the webinar, CDP acknowledges that we work on the stolen lands of the many original peoples. We recognize that indigenous peoples have been displaced and disenfranchised from the land by socioeconomic and cultural impacts of colonialism and disasters. The erasure of indigenous knowledge about how to care for these lands has caused environmental destruction and degradation. CDP is committed to dismantling the ongoing legacies, systems, and structures of settler colonialism and white supremacy and their connections to philanthropy today and in the future. Despite centuries of theft, violence, and murder, this still and always will be indigenous land. Please join us in acknowledging the original peoples and their elders, the past, present, and future generations. So we do have a few goals uh, for this webinar. So at the end uh, of this webinar, we hope that you will understand the principles and importance of disaster case management. Um, we will probably refer to it often as DCM, that you'll be aware of how community DCM programs intersect with government sponsored case management programs. And you'll learn from some specific real life examples of successful DCM programs. So Adrian, if you put the poll up, thank you. We'll just uh, take a minute to see who is on uh, with us today. Um, it looks like it's a pretty even distribution of those of you who have a pretty clear uh, understanding of what uh, disaster case management is um, and the difference between case management and disaster case management. Um, and some of you are just not even sure there is a difference. So we're gonna chat a little bit about that. Excited to share that with you. And also for the second question, um, that uh, you, some of you are in organizations that engage um, in this, and it looks like some of you are here perhaps because hopefully you want to learn about um, some ways in which you might think about engaging in the future. So thank you so much for answering uh, those uh, questions for us. And, and we hope that um, as we go along in our conversation, um, that we'll be able to uh, uh, share and move all of us along um, in this, this conversation about disaster case management together. It's now uh, my honor to introduce our special guests. Uh, I am really looking forward to the information that they will share with us. Um, Kristen Kelly Monahan is the owner of Kelly Nonprofit Consulting, which strengthens nonprofits to elevate their impact. 
Since 2006, they have deepened the philanthropic sector's work through spearheaded trust-based community-led grant making and other collective impact initiatives. From managing the Oregon Disaster Funders Network on behalf of the Ford Family Foundation and the Roundhouse Foundation, to managing the Collaborative Community Rebuilding Fund, to supporting several LTRGs and recovery communities directly, Kelly NPC supports a variety of disaster response, recovery, and resilience efforts in the Pacific Northwest. Thanks, Kristen, for joining us today. Also, we'll have uh, with us Maria Gonzalez. Maria is the Director for Disaster Case Management at SVP. She's based in South Carolina. In 2016, she worked for Palmetto Disaster Recovery as a disaster case manager through a FEMA grant before becoming a supervisor for one of the Palmetto Disaster Offices in 2018. She began her most recent position with SVP in 2022. Thank you as well, Maria, for joining us today. Um, so I am really excited to chat with Kristen and Maria today, but before we dive a little bit into that conversation, I want to briefly highlight the new disaster case management tool, uh, toolkit in CDP's uh, disaster uh, playbook. Um, so to start out with, uh, just to, to provide a little bit of a definition of what disaster case management is, um, the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, or VOAD, defines a disaster case management as a time-limited process, uh, which is a partnership between the disaster-affected individual or family, um, which allows them to achieve realistic, set and achieve realistic goals for recovery following a disaster. Um, disaster case managers uh, become the primary contact uh, for those families and individuals, help them find those resources um, and, uh, and move families forward into this recovery process together. Some communities might refer to this as disaster advocates, navigators, they are partners, they are connectors, they are conduits uh, for disaster, uh, disaster uh, recovery for individuals and families. And if you could go to the next slide, um, disaster case management, I believe, is essential to the recovery process. It's the space which allows communities to really um, get to those disaster affected families and individuals to, to determine their specific needs and to meet those very specific needs for each of those families and individuals. It's a space also where it allows us as communities to go beyond relief, meeting relief and basic needs. It provides a vetted process that we can work with disaster survivors, again, for their unique path to recovery. And I think that disaster case management is also really the space where we can really support equitable community-wide recovery, the information, uh, distribution of resources. Um, if you could go to the next slide, um, there are a variety of, of levels um, for uh, um, disaster case management. Um, and so uh, and uh, so the first one we'll just chat about for a second is disaster casework and the difference between disaster casework versus disaster case management. And the difference really lies in the timing, the duration, and the services. So casework typically is early interventions uh, that are provided to meet and address immediate needs, um, shelter, uh, food, uh, medications, access to those types of resources um, in the community. It, it typically uh, lasts uh, for a shorter amount of time. Um, and uh, disaster case management then is those ongoing uh, lo longer services that extend beyond that relief, beyond referrals and beyond meeting urgent needs. In some communities, disaster case work and some disasters, depending on the scope and scale of the disaster, uh, the majority of individuals impacted uh, may just need case work. They need, need some help with those early interventions uh, and then they can move uh, into, uh, into recovery on their own. Others. Uh, other families and individuals will need that longer term, um, more uh, complex uh, navigation and help with their uh, with longer term needs. Some disaster case management is locally defined where communities are responsible for developing and implementing their own processes. This happens especially in low attention disasters uh, where they are um, not declared and where there are others not coming into the community to provide these types of assistance. Um, 
the uh, the next level really is a state defined um, system. So some states have either a designated disaster case management organization um, that is set to to provide that type of resource um, every time there's a disaster. Um, and others um, have actually a state funded um, subsidized organization that uh, is where they're funding disaster case management to provide those resources. And the final level is really this de federally defined system. Uh, at times in declared disasters where there's individual assistance available to families, uh, FEMA may fund a supplemental program um, that is called uh, the Disaster Case Management Program or DCMP. So this is uh, again, a federally funded and awarded system and does have additional uh, requirements and guidelines and regulations that must be adhere adhered to. Austin, you can go to, I'm sorry, Adrian, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so when we think about implementing disaster case management, um, I think about, especially in communities that I work in, um, that these disaster case management have, programs have these four pieces uh, built into them, that there is first some coordination happening, that they're not organizations that are uh, doing things on their own or individuals doing things on their own, but they're coordinating with others. There's typically a long-term recovery committee or some sort of coalition built in the community uh, to help uh, move these things forward. There is training and coaching provided. Um, so there are experts and people who have been doing disaster case management and, and understand the nuances and pieces uh, that are can be made willing and available uh, to come to communities to provide that type of training and coaching and expertise um, that's needed. The third thing is that there are resources. Um, we cannot uh, do disaster case management if there's no resources to provide to clients. It, it, it's not helpful to sit with a client and help them figure out what their recovery process might be um, unless you have some ideas of how you, uh, what resources are available, unless there's unmet needs money available for the materials that they need, for example. And then the fourth one I always look at is support. Um, so disaster case managers, uh, it's, a, it's a huge time commitment. Um, there's a lot of things involved in it. And those case managers themselves need uh, support and able to do that, whether that's mental wellness support, whether that's actual funding to pay salaries, um, to make sure that they have space for their family, whether that's retreats that they're able to go on to get a break from the, from the ongoing stress of, of walking multiple families through a recovery process, um, that support needs to be built into uh, the disaster case management services uh, that are provided. And then my last slide is just a little bit of an overview of a couple other things that are available in our toolkit. Um, there is some recommendations for funders available in there, and we um, will talk about some of those again today throughout our conversation. There's some examples of some uh, CDP uh, disaster case management grants um, and ones that we have we have provided in the past. And then there is also a job description for a case manager, um, some ideas for other organizations that provide case management uh, resources and expertise. So we're going to turn now to our conversation uh, with Kristen and Maria. Um, and uh, we're going to just start a little bit with our um, our why. So I want to start with that importance of case management um, and a quick story about either client experience or community experience that helps us stay motivated um, in uh, in this this work. So I will just start quick uh, with myself. So my one of my very first days um, working for a disaster recovery organization, I ended up in a room full of disaster uh, case man. Well, they were they were case managers who had been asked to step into disaster work, um, and uh, they were about six months after after a flood. And I walked into a room full of people who were um, very angry. They were very emotional. They were exhausted. They were, but they were still passionate and they were still fighting for those clients and those people that they were working for. And they needed some resources to be able to do that. And so for me, I always think of that now in this role as um, helping support disaster case management programs. Um, I think about how are we supporting those uh, champions, those heroes, those individuals who step into that role as case manager and make sure that they are they have what they need um, to do to do the work that's really important as they they translate that on to the individuals and families and clients that they work with. So, um, Kristen, uh, love to hear from you. What is your why? Sure, thanks, Carrie. <clears throat> I would say that a recent we had a recent fire uh, here that impacted uh, 
rural community, uh, individuals living in very low income households um, with a variety of barriers from disabilities to language to physical and, um, and, and mental medical conditions. And this was the same general area as a fire from 2021. So there was an LTRG in the area nearby in the county um, staffed by a single person funded um, by a single philanthropic funder most recently to keep that LTRG um, alive. There was still a little bit of recovery from the 2021 fire needed, um, but because they were there and ready, they were able to spring right into action. And because they had an understanding of case management, they could right away um, start doing some of that casework immediately. And they were local, they knew the local community, they knew the barriers of the survivors, the barriers that they would face as disaster case managers and the LTRG. So um, it would just really show to me that really that power and the impact of just one individual, just one funder um, is going to have an impact on so many others. And just seeing the, um, as the devastating 2020 fires in Oregon happened to the most recent ones, seeing the increase in coordination, communication, some of that work faster and better and, and improve and building on that, um, making each disaster a little less disaster-y um, because of that, uh, that previous work. So it's been great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Kristen. Maria, uh, would you be willing to share your why with us? Yeah, absolutely. So my story is a little similar to yours, Gary. Um, I came in to the DCM role and I think in the room, everyone was new. They all had different backgrounds. Um, so once I stepped in, there was a lot of why, what am I doing? Uh, questions did not interact with clients. till probably a month or two later. And when I started interacting with these clients, um, they were emotional, they were angry, um, and they had a lot of questions. So what I try to do was kind of study the material and make sure that I was able to answer question, no promises or no guarantees. But I had many um, citizens that came in and just appreciated all the transparency. Um, it did take a toll on me, I think mentally, because you really, as a DCN, you have to be mentally prepared to deal with the different stories that you're going to listen to. And it was my first time doing DCM in the state of South Carolina, um, cause I had just moved to South Carolina. So, um, I had very great stories, um, great citizens that came back just to thank me for my transparency, honesty, and compassion. And that's when I actually realized like I belong as a DCN. Uh, so that's that's my story. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and uh, I just um, would wonder, Maria, if you could if we could continue the conversation uh, with some feedback on the toolkit. So how do you feel like the toolkit may be useful for communities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. I mean, when I saw the toolkit, it just provides a broader image of what a DCM consists of. It defines the true meaning of DCM, knowing the beginning stages to the end. It is crucial in this role. Um, the rule is we hold on to the client along the way, teach them, guide them, and start embracing them. There is hope in the midst of the storm because we all know they lose hope at, at some point. This toolkit has the ability to explain the differences the different organization levels of DCM, the implementation and support needed, and information on multiple resources. And I just, I really encourage everyone to take time to read this toolkit and use it as a future um, guide in the DCM world. Thank you. I love that phrase, hold on to every client along the way. That That's just what a good picture of what disaster case management can be, it looks like. Uh, Kristen, uh, the same question to you. 
Sure, yeah, I think it's a, a fabulous tool. And I really like the distinction of the various options um, for disaster case management based on severity, based on declarations. Um, we have heard, we've also heard some misperceptions that disaster case management is sort of taken care of or fully funded by federal dollars, but that's just not the case, not always the case. And even in some cases where there is federal funding um, for a disaster case management program, the network of supports that has to be in place for it to run well and and um, to really truly meet the needs is extensive. There's never enough funding. So even including a concept that disaster case management is, is fundable by non-public dollars is really important. And I think shifting that mindset. Um, and then as a, a firm that supports both the philanthropic sector and community-based organizations, we love seeing a grant application in there. Um, we write probably 80 grants a month for clients. And even in blue sky times, so many nonprofits, especially under resourced, smaller, newer, which is often the case in disasters, the grant writing is so challenging. So to have that in their back pocket is really great to see um, and it, as a guide and to see also too of the um, position description and you know all of those, it's, it's really, um, really will give them a jump start. Thank you. You know, we uh, included those pieces because uh, we had found in our history as uh, the early recovery fund walking into many of those communities where disaster case management needed to be locally driven and set up kind of as things occurred um, that, you know, even, yeah, just what you said, that even having a basic description and understanding of what we were doing. Um, and then the hope is that organizations can take that to funders and say, this is what we want to do. Um, or funders can take that to organizations and say, this is what we we would love to support. Can we work together to, to collaborate on that? So uh, just thank you for, for putting that out. Thank you both so much for your feedback. And I just also want to offer uh, to others, like as, as you're looking at that toolkit, like we are uh, in a place where we're, we are open to that type of feedback um, to help us make that better, because we do want to make this a tool that is useful uh, for funders to understand this need and to have some really uh, tangible action steps that they can take um, in the midst of that. And then, you know, on the opposite side as well, or not opposite, but is to, to give a resource for uh, those local or organizations that are looking for support and how they how they can do um, do recovery work in their communities and, and after disaster. So, um, Kristen, we're gonna uh, stay with you then for a second. So, in the planning meeting, uh, you mentioned that there's a difference between capital D and lowercase D case management. Uh, what is the difference between the two? Yeah, it started out as an internal distinction that we were making to distinguish the federally funded disaster case management program with the state defined and locally defined um, because we in, in our state, we had all of the above and at various times and in, in, in stages. So, and especially recently as the federal funds have run out for the disaster case management program, um, it has moved into, um, you know, state and locally driven. So, um, but, but broadly it's meant to also cover and sort of give some validation to the incredible case management work that's being done without the support of uh, FEMA federal dollars or the state and in those gray areas where even when there are federal funds or state funds, the time it takes for contracts to be signed and for funds to be operational has been astronomical. And um, in those cases, it is uh, the, the, the individual cases of individuals are protected and moved forward truly by the the grace and the ethics and the goodwill of community organizations who are not being paid yet or don't have the full resources to do this work, but are doing it anyway. Um, and so it was to, to include that that is disaster case management um, um, as well. It doesn't have to necessarily just be the federally uh, funded uh, program. So um, yeah, that was that was where, I, where it started. <clears throat> Thanks. Great. Um uh, so Maria, you worked in both of those uh, big D and small D, the, the state and federally funded DCM programs and community funded DCM. Uh, what for you are the differences? Okay, so um, I guess I'll probably speak more on the federal funded DCM program, just because I started under the FEMA grant. And I just see that there is a difference because um, everything is kind of it's there's guidelines behind it. So you're limited to what you can do when it becomes a federal um, grant. But when you're working with a community where you have donated uh, money, there's a little bit of more flexibility there, um, especially with 
and I think one of the challenges we had were the AMI, you know, where with the federal program, there's an there's a, a percentage, and then if you go to one of the community, their percentages are higher. So the chances of these clients moving over to these community programs to qualify for, let's just say, a roof, they have a higher chance, you know. So um, I think that's the difference. And I did work with community BCNs and one of the organizations that we work with, they were very, very helpful. And, you know, despite the fact that I was under the federal um, funded grant, I worked very closely with the community grant as well. And anything I could do to make it easier for the client, that's what I wanted to do. They were frustrated as it is. I didn't want them to gain more frustration um, through this process. So, um, you know, I I hope that was I was able to answer the question a little bit between both. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and you both talked to, about this local focus. Um, so Kristen, why is it important to have a local focus for case management? Yeah, I would say simply put, they know they know the community. So and in disaster case management work, whatever the lowercase, uppercase, whoever it's being funded, it is at its core, it is person to person work where a lot of trust needs to be built. Um, and so disaster case management are currently, you know, working those barriers, working through those barriers. And so, um, you know, it is just really essential, especially in working in underserved communities, it might be isolated communities geographically, uh, maybe communities where um, there's a large uh, Latino population or Native American population need folks to know who they need to know the people they need to know the terrain and most importantly need to know those points of access how to reach people and how best to reach people effectively um, and and know kind of who's doing what in the community um, it makes it more efficient efficient of what resources are available and what can be leveraged and how best to leverage them we've also seen really clear examples where groups who were not local had a harder time hiring people and then sort of placing them in communities um, what happened is that there would just be a simply a higher turnover and so uh, there were uh, individual survivors who are having to retell their story again and again and again and be sort of tra re-traumatized by it and and heard of many cases unfortunately where they left the case case management because they um they sort of gave up on the process um and so that a lot of that was solved um when the case managers moved it moved into more of a local model um so and and meanwhile locally there was a really engaged group of volunteers who would have and eventually did um you know turn into the paid you know disaster case managers or you know resource navigators so um just knowing those barriers knowing those access points <clears throat> thank you Yeah, so, you know, we just kind of following up on that. So we do engage uh, with a lot of communities and it sounds like you have too that have no kind of experience with uh, with case management. Um, they're, uh, they, you know, they um, there's not an identified organization that has done this before. Um, they're kind of stepping into that role a little bit. So um, as I'm just thinking about that, um, you know, I think about the, a couple of things that that we do as we think about building that local capacity and do that. And what you've already mentioned it, right, is finding those organizations that are or those individuals that are already doing it somehow. Um, some of that case management, right, where there's an organization that's doing a different kind of case management or it's a the, uh, you know, sm some rural communities, it's the church secretary that is helping people navigate different processes already. Um, there's still spaces right. where there's already right people kind of doing that work. So um, finding them, identifying them, and then supporting that uh, becomes really important. And that was the question exactly that I was going to uh, bring for you is that, yeah, hoping you could share more about how how do you engage in communities that don't, don't have that experience with case management, or there are no identified organizations that do that work. So yeah, and like I said, it's finding those, those, uh, mm -hmm. those people that are already doing it, and then providing making sure that they have the support. I always think about like, I think we can we can teach people that disaster side of it, mm -hmm. enough of it to do the work, but those soft skills of yeah. being able to walk alongside somebody with that empathy and that ability to, you know, hold on to them uh, through this whole process. Um, 
if, again, if people are already doing that, like we support that work. I also am a huge proponent of um, having everybody in the community that's interested be trained in the disaster case management piece. So bringing in uh, someone who can engage really well with the local community and provide some training and resources because then if everybody kind of understands what this process is, again, it's more transparent. It helps us understand where the roadblocks might be um, and to keep things uh, moving forward a little bit. And I think that builds then local capacity. So one of you mentioned like what happens the next time another disaster, so you've got people already in place that can um, continue to continue to do that, that resources. Um, and then, you know, along with the training, I always think too about um, supporting them with that, that coaching or that, that expertise, because there are cases that are going to come up with some things that you've never even thought were possible, right? And what do you do with that? And so having some, some experts such as yourselves, right, from outside the community that can come in and engage and say, and help with uh, individual pieces without sharing personal information and that kind of piece, right? But to say, hey, like, I know somebody in this organization that can help with this particular issue. Let's let's connect and move that forward. Um, so those are the things. Um, Maria, just turning to you, uh, what are the different ways that you have uh, reached out to individuals who might need case management uh, services? Okay, so um, creativity, that's the new thing now, right? Everyone's just being creative. So one of the things that we tried to implement in our program was uh, when we had a citizen come in, um, tell them, spread the word. That's number one. Um, spread the word that there is DCM out here, social media, community meetings, um, or participating in outdoor events or fairs and just kind of walk around and pass out flyers. Um, the schools. So what we did was we created a flyer and of course we talked to the school district and we would provide the children to take home flyers to share it with their family members because not everyone is on social media. So um, we want to try to reach that population that maybe through the children, grandchildren, they can take home the paperwork. So that was kind of one of the things that we did use and I also wanted to just share a quick story because it's kind of what happened to me with a citizen who had no idea that DCM even existed for one of the storms that we had. And it was actually through a family member. So um, I was with my mom and she was explaining to me that she, had, she knew someone that was affected by the storm, had roof damage, had mold in the home. She was elderly and she was disabled. And that's when I told my mom, well, tell her about the program. You know, she needs to apply. And she did. And today, we received a brand new home. So this is what you want to do. Because as a DCM, is not only in your office. You need to share it as much as you can, spread the word, but also get your citizens um, or the folks that are coming into your office engaged so they can share uh, this information. Absolutely. And it's always, it always surprised me the first couple of times I did this at how long it took some people to find out that their resource or how, how hesitant people were at some points to come and ask for help. And so it would be months, sometimes years later, um, where they would, they would show up and, uh, yeah, that word of mouth becomes so important because again, uh, people are disclosing um, some really personal information to their case manager. So they want to know that it's somebody that they can trust uh, to follow through with them and for them. Yeah, and I just wanted to add something in, and this was kind of what Kristen had said, and I like that, just kind of training um, the community. So the other day I was talking to my nephew, and he's only eight years old, and when there's a storm, stirring up he's like oh my god oh my god and i'm like no baby it's not an oh my god it's you need to prepare and learn how to prepare mm -hmm. so it's 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 an awesome way to teach everyone even the children that can probably help the parents or the grandparents in in preparing where they can find this toolkit you know so they can take a look at this toolkit or other preparedness toolkits I just wanted to throw that in there because I, I just felt that at such a young age, it was very inspiring um, how he just came up with that and 
I was able to give them a resolution. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what a important important reminder too that we embed uh, preparedness um, into all of our conversations, no matter no matter where we are, right? Uh, to move that forward. So I do have a, one more question for each of you that uh, is uh, here, and then we're going to move to the audience questions and uh, in a minute. So uh, for those of you, just please don't forget to put your questions. I see some of them are already coming in um, in the Q and A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those shortly. So. To help funders who are listening, uh, Kristen, can you tell us about the funding needs and gaps that funders could assist with? Gladly, yes, and thank you for bringing this up. It's so important um, because there is, um, there's, I think really just knowing and understanding that this, that this is not something that, um, public agencies are covering or are covering fully, um, there is a significant need for philanthropic support. And in several communities that were eventually supported with some federal dollars, it was the philanthropic community that carried them through those first, it wasn't even months, it was the first year plus before some of those contracts and funds were operational um, from a state and federal level. So um, just knowing how important those resources are, but in terms of what specifically to fund, um, you know, you know, staffing, um, supporting staffing, supporting, um, you know, Maria has, has mentioned just the challenging nature of this work. So, so providing, providing care for the caregivers is so essential, um, supporting them with resources, with, um, with additional care and access to um, benefits, decent wages. Um, it'd be great to have a lot more than just benef some benefits and decent wages, but even getting to that place would be would be wonderful for so many of those who are so underfunded right now. Um, and really, I would say too, is um, flexible funding, even more than sort of what funding is for, funding that is flexible because needs across recovery are ever evolving. And so we've had communities where, um, whether it's an LTRG or community-based organization, you know, providing support and then um, they've got a, you know, a great local match and some local resources from local businesses. So individual needs are taken care of. Those end, those go away. Now it, it shifts from needing um, staff support to needing more individual um, supports for survivors. So it just that flexibility and funds and needs really shift um, throughout. So, um, but staffing is a big one, flexible funds, training, um, and um, just sort of that kind of filling in the gaps too. Uh, I, I think on that, on that gap question, um, and this one is for you, Maria, there's always uh, on often, there's a gap between disaster and then getting people home. Um, why are there such delays and how can funders help to address that? Okay, um, I'm going to speak on my experience here in South Carolina. I'm sure many other states are having similar challenges, but you know, just the application process, you know, just getting that piece done, collecting the documentation that you need. Sometimes individuals don't have it. They lost it, misplaced it, um, or there's airship issues in the home. Um, so I feel like that's kind of the first delay, just having to apply. And then you have the DOB, the duplication of benefits. You have to go through all that process. You know, FEMA, SBA, home insurance. Um, and then I would probably say, you know, because of COVID, many things have changed. So now you have the lack of uh, materials that contractors have access to, um, to the lack of not having enough contractors or contractors kind of shifting to other areas. So um, I don't know if I really have a resolution on how it can get better, but it's just something that everyone is pretty much going through right now um and before anyone can really start swinging hammers you know these are these are just some of the things that that we're having issues with today yeah definitely so you know some of those some of those gap is important right because there's some space to to wait and make sure we are all coordinating resources together and moving them forward but i also hear that there's some places where we can fill some of those needs to move things faster uh, in the process as well. Uh, Kristen, you had uh, one more funding opportunity uh, or need yeah, to thanks. add. 
Thanks. It was just in terms of reaching folks and how important that is, and especially in places where, um, you know, there isn't um, broadband or there isn't internet access. It's so important to go where the people are. And, and that takes travel time, that takes resources. And then once you get there, being able, we've heard crushing stories of, um, you know, where the I'm at these round table and you know funding is gone and so individuals can't to get um the funding they're being supported by a disaster case manager but there's no support to give them so in individual supports that can be provided being flexible in those as well having uh, the ability to provide gas cards or cash cards giving as much autonomy and dignity as possible to let individuals also have some flexible funds to support their own uh, well-being and wellness throughout the recovery process is another really important need that would that is a gap that is always needs to be filled um, and we hear a, sometimes from funders who focus more on the longer term or the systemic change and and to us you know having that essential steps of having um, you know, a roof over your head, being made whole, um, wh whatever that case may be in the individual cases um, is an essential first step to being able to participate in, um, you know, um, local municipal hearings as to what may or may not be rebuilt in your community. I mean, being able to have a place to stay, um, being able to access childcare, being able to have a job, being able to have identification to cash your paychecks again, or, you know, that that is the types of support that disaster case managers and resource navigators, you know, help um, individuals, you know, navigate. So there's just so many needs out there. Um, and it's something disasters, once they're, you know, out of the news, they're just so um, underfunded. Did. So, thank you. Yeah, I just uh, before we move to audience questions, just want to thank both of you so much for all of this uh, uh, wisdom and expertise and uh, brilliance. I see a couple of comments about about your both of your individual brilliance in the world, and so I just really appreciate that you brought this um, to us all today. Um, just thinking about a couple things um, that you know really have have stuck out to me so far in the conversation. Um, it was just really this ability. I think I think it might have been you, Kristen, to mention this ability to, to validate all different types of case management and to make sure that we understand that the, the local uh, case management, the, the people that are helping their neighbor navigate um, are just as vital and important in these systems as the big D, the, the professional disaster case management who have may have seen hundreds of cases and that we need both of those people pieces to work together. And I think that's also the other thing um, to just uh, to just highlight, right, that all of us need to think about the spaces where uh, we need those early interventions, those pieces need to be funded, that flexible piece, but then we also need to remember the long term and how this can change systems and, and, and address some of these systemic issues that are occurring within our communities. And, it, and we have to, we have to, we have to pay attention, we have to understand, and we have to move within uh, both of those spaces to do this uh, successfully. Um, but then, Maria, I just really appreciate that at the end of the day, you continue to remind us that it's about those individuals, the, the people, the dignity and the humanity of the, the person that is uh, working uh, through what may be some of the worst uh, days of their life um, towards, towards getting back home or towards having a home that is safe and stable and secure um, and towards taking care of their family and all of those pieces. So thank you for reminding us that it's um, it's about it's about the individual and the person in front of us as well. Um, we did have a couple of questions uh, come in beforehand in an advance. And so I'm gonna work through that list as well as uh, some of the questions that are in the Q&A box right now. Um, as a reminder, uh, CDP webinars are aimed at providing education for the philanthropic community. So while all are welcome um, to pose a question, we're gonna first focus on those questions that are addressing um, some funder issues. Um, so Maria, I think the first question I have uh, posed to you, um, how can governor government partners best support and collaborate with NGOs when working with disaster survivors? Okay. Um, sorry, I just had to take that box off. How can government partner best support? Well, I think just there are a lot of communication. We need a lot of communication among all partners um, and share everything that we know um, and collaborated. 
um, one of the chat, you know, and I'll speak on one of the challenges that I had uh, when I worked with the state program. It's just there wasn't a lot of communication um, with partners, and a lot of time it just felt like people were holding on to things and not kind of releasing it, which was a little bit um, frustrating. You know, not having access to that stuff when I really kind of needed that information. So, you know, not having a, a survivor that has this urgent need, you know, I just feel like there has to be a whole lot of communication um, within all parties. Kristen, anything to add into that mix? Yes, I completely agree. Yeah, the communication piece, getting folks talking, working together. Um, Kristen, we do have a question um, about um, about Maui, and I know that you have been involved in that in that conversation a little bit as it's progressing today. So, if you have uh, some answers for that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, sure. It was about how to. Um, support funding, what to, to do now with funding that could support the longer term process. And, and when we were managing the community or are managing the community rebuilding fund, um, one of the first things that we did was call uh, folks who were more, um, you know, had more experience with um, uh, wildfire specifically. And, and, and they said, save, save your funding, do not spend it all at once. And so we made a strategic decision to spend our, this, to, to allocate the money out into three different phases, um, which was really, we heard was really helpful and essential to provide a sort of um, consistent drip, um, you know, over the course of, of two plus years was um, incredibly helpful in filling those gaps in those wait times before, you know, uh, public contracts can be signed, can be in hand, or those funds are operational. Um, and, and just to be that, that the gap filler as well. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Maybe I'll pose this one again to you first, Maria. Um, uh, as you're thinking about what needs to happen to ensure better planning and coordinate, uh, what needs to happen to ensure better planning and coordination around the entire disaster mitigation preparedness response and recovery continue? Um, well, it, it goes back to, you know, communication, but also having a process flow. Um, having a process flow is very essential um, in any program. Otherwise, things will fall through the cracks um, if they're not captured. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, uh, Kristen, this goes a little bit more into what you were just sharing about, um, but a little bit more about how you communicate the importance of phases uh, of funding to your to your funders and donors and other funders. Um, so again, oftentimes we want to spend that money really quickly. Uh, do you have anything more to add uh, to, into that conversation? Yeah, that it's um, the support is a complex stew of learning what survivors may have, if it may be in, um, some insurance to tap into, if it may be um, community resources and uh, businesses that have some dollars to give, even within the philanthropic community. All of those processes take time, sometimes significant time um, to talk with their decision makers, to get consensus among trustees, to get consensus among a business owner or a group. And so um, just the time that, that everything takes, we um, we have disasters currently from 2020 um, that have significant recovery remaining, an estimated additional two to seven years um, and, and probably longer in, in, in two areas. So um, it's just a, um, it is a uh, it's a marathon, and so being able to reserve some funds and um, not be, um, I would say, tempted to 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 spend those all immediately for the immediate response needs is is essential. Um, and just recovery, it's like response needs are well funded, recovery medium, um, and then you know any type of mitigation preparation, as you very well know, Carrie and Maria are so, so chronically underfunded, um, and so just being mindful of what um, 
how that can be you know improved and for some of our funders they are now um, taking steps to create specific set asides of funding um, specific for disaster response recovery uh, and resiliency and that's really uh, been game changing for our communities. So, um, and some of them aren't fully live or ready yet, but they're on their way. And um, and and it's taken a few years to get to that point, but um, it's the community is going to be stronger for it. Yeah, that sounds that sounds fantastic. I would love to learn to learn more from you about those pieces, uh, Maria. Same question. Um, I mean, I think this probably also applies to uh, individuals that you're working with, and and all kinds of ways in which we communicate, kind of that importance of of phasing uh, funding. Uh, so, how do you talk to your clients, and or how does your organization approach that conversation with funders or donors? Well, um, one of the things that I've always um, kept with me, a previous uh, manager of mine always told me there's this amount of people and like this amount of funding, you know, so a lot of times what I what I did with a lot of the clients that came into the office is I was very transparent with them, you know, and again, going back to never promising or guaranteeing anything explaining to them, you know, there's this amount of people, but this amount of funding. So um, it just goes back to just being transparent with the client. Thank you. Um, another question that came in, um, and I think we've, we've kind of addressed this uh, a little bit already in our conversations, but I'd love to hear um, if you have other thoughts on it. How do communities um, maintain experienced community-based DCMs to help survivors avoid uh, you know, those that bad choices that are potential uh, in the middle it, it, early on in disaster. Um, so again, how do, um, and maybe we'll start with you, Kristen, like how do you think about communities kind of maintaining that capacity to do disaster case management long-term? Yeah, I think shifting the mindsets of um, funders, whether they be public or uh, private to, um, recognize the role that, uh, first of all, everything that can be learned from folks who have been through a disaster and who have walked alongside and supported those going through a disaster. Um, there's so much that gained from those processes. So um, supporting those organizations who have been in it so that they can use the knowledge uh, to benefit other communities, whether it's in working, ideally in preparing before a disaster uh, strikes, especially in higher you know, risk areas, um, or just being able to do that peer-to-peer -peer learning. But um, I think it's just, it's really, um, shifting the mindset of how essential supporting uh, recovery, you know, true full recovery is to all other aspects of a community, um, to economic well-being, to ecological, you know, vibrancy, to so much um, of a community. And so at some point it stops being, you know, re uh, recovery from a specific incident and it's just, you know, general community needs that are, um, that are, that are so essential and that, that, disasters can really um, make such a lasting impact on communities and set set them back, especially um, you know, systemic barriers and institutionalized barriers back, you know, a really, really long time to sort of crawl back into that. So not losing all that's been invested, frankly. So ho however, to um, provide that ongoing support, and that just takes um, making space for it, making allocations for it um, at, the, at, the, at the funding level. And again, this is public or private. Yeah, and uh, Maria, for you, uh, either answer that question or if there's anything else that you want to share in our last few moments together, I'll just give you a chance to do that. No, I, I totally agree with Kristen. Um, when you lose, you know, when you lose your DCMs, you lose everything that you've invested. So I, I can't, I'm going to mention something. I can't speak too much on it, but I could definitely get you a link in South Carolina. What they, what they're doing, and I'm actually one of them is they have, um, created this new thing and, and I can't really speak on it too much, but I am a reservist so if a storm was to happen here in south carolina i activate um 
And being that I still have the knowledge that I have, there's not much training to do. I just go and do what I know what to do. And they've done that with a lot of other DCNs that they've been able to keep um, through the FEMA grant, because we all know that when you are a DCN through any federal grant, it's, you know, the grant's going to go away, money's going to diminish. So you want to keep these folks with all this knowledge, so much investment, as Kristen said. Um, so that's what South Carolina has done. Um, and I'm currently one of them. That sounds like a fantastic, a fantastic model as well. And um, unfortunately, uh, that's really all the time that we have for questions today. Um, but as we begin to uh, wrap up, um, I want to provide uh, the audience with some actionable thoughts from our conversation. Um, so the first one is to really fund for the long term. Government funded case management wraps up long before the full disaster recovery. Case managers need to be able to take the time uh, that they need to know the community, develop plans, and help clients work towards their best outcomes. The hardest cases to solve often take the longest and need support from outside the traditional case management process. The second one is to get out of the office. The best case management is offered in community. And this includes places where people already live and gather whether, when it's necessary to do door to door. Funders can help by covering the cost of transportation for clients and case managers, providing training, trauma-informed services, community meetings, and additional supports to provide the most direct case management services possible. And then finally is to help fund the solutions. It's often easy to develop a case plan. It's harder to implement. The greatest plan in the world does nothing if there's no money for materials or those materials aren't available. If there's not licensed contractors or others to fill those gaps, if there are government delays, et cetera. So provide funding that's flexible for the resources needed to bring families home from bricks and mortar to furniture and vehicles to staff support and all of the other spaces in between. Um, you can find uh, many resources that can assist you on CDP's website, from our issue insights to our disaster profiles to our disaster philanthropy pay playbook. CDP provides numerous resources for those planning disaster funding. There is a monthly newsletter full of information and regular blogs, including our we weekly What We're Watching blog that highlights disasters around the world. CDP's staff team is always available to provide guidance, and if you need more in-depth assistance, we also provide various consulting services. You can find out more information about our work at disasterphilanthropy.org. Uh, we will be taking a break in September from our regular, our regular webinars, but we'll be back on October 12th to discuss funding low attention disasters. Um, and just keep an eye on our space. We are uh, planning a webinar for next week, uh, specifically around um, Hawaii. Um, in order to respect everyone's time and to keep this to an hour, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's webinar. I want to thank our co-sponsors again, and especially Maria and Kristen for taking the time to share um, their insights with us. I really appreciate the conversation today and look forward to how this potentially has sparked additional conversations for the future. Um, please take a moment uh, to complete our post-webinar survey and to let us know what you would like, what you liked and what you would like to see in future webinars. It will pop up automatically when you exit the webinar. If you have questions or thoughts that were not addressed during today's webinar, you may email them to tanya.gulliver-garcia at disasterphilanthropy.org. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon. <laughs>